Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome along to the Music Makers live stream. And uh, can you please let us know that you can see and hear us, please? Come on, come on. Let's just this is this could this will be the smoothest ever intro if it actually works. <laughs> Hopefully, you sure, you sure we're live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are definitely live. Yeah, I haven't made that mistake again, Adam. Don't worry. Fool uh, me once. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> we me messed once. it up once. Um, everybody, let us know where you're dialing in from. Where are you in the world? Check that you can hear us, please. Martin's here from Rochester. First in today. Yeah, you get the you get the you get the honor, Martin. You get the first. Uh, you were first in. You get displayed on the screen before anybody else. Brilliant, everybody. Thank you for letting us know that you are all here. It Martin Harvey, and Chris Smith. Where are you in Canada? Let us know. I am also in Canada. Yeah. It is very dull in England today. It is very rainy. It is very gray. But despite that, we've got a great show for you today because we've got so much to get through. I'm super excited because today is Beatles Day. The Beatles released a brand new single today, which we're going to talk about later in the show. We've also got some cool chord tips that I want to share with you, some more advanced theory stuff that we're going to discuss, some very beginner level stuff. And also we've got a couple of um, cool little pieces of guitar ga uh, gear and accessories that we, we, we wanted to uh, run through with you. Adam, how have you been, mate? Very well, brother. I'm very well today. I got my coffee going. It's uh, it's as bright and sunny as it could possibly get for the beginning of November over here. So I'm never better, my man. Happy Good to be story. here with all of you. Everybody's yes. bright eyed and bushy tailed today. Everybody's showing up. Good on you all for showing up for yourselves. We got a great session for you all today. And if you got questions about music, we have answers. Oh boy. Thanks. If you got Q's, we've got A's. We got um, A's. Yeah, brilliant, awesome. Thank you. Everybody can see and hear us. Great, everyone. It's I can't keep up with all the comments. There's so many comment, so many comments here. It's great. Everyone, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for dialing in. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for investing in your creativity. Thank you for committing to your creativity. Um, Gary, yeah, dude, we're going to talk about that more later in the show. Gary said he found the new Beatles song very emotional. As did I, Gary. As did I. Hearing John Lennon's voice, that kind of haunting opening melody of that track. Yeah, I got I got goosebumps listening to that. We're going to talk about that later in the show. Um, everybody, we are about to begin, but before we do, Rick, let's look at Adam's cool hat. <laughs> yeah, Rick. If you like the back of it, you'll like the front better. Check it out. Talents overrated. Be be unique. Oh. Does is that what it says? Oh, that's that's the t that's the t shirt. Yeah, but the hat says "Thank you, Toronto." <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, thank you, Toronto is like a, I guess, like a charity organization, and you can buy hats from them and apparel. And uh, I forget what the cause is, only because I, I bought this hat like five years ago, maybe maybe more. But well, it looks uh, cool. Yeah, they're it a great looks... company, man. It's faded as hell at this point. It's, things been so beat up. <laughs> it looks cool, and it was for a good cause, so it's That's win, it. win, win. Everybody, we got to dive in. It's five past. Come on, we've got stuff to do. We've got stuff to talk about. Um, right, everyone, be, we're gonna be before we be jump in here. If you've got any questions that you want any help with, any guitar questions, anything you're struggling with, anything you've always wanted to know about, anything that's holding you back as a guitarist, please post it into the chat. We will do our best to answer those comments as we go through. Um, if at any time you've got any questions about anything we're talking about, go ahead, drop it in the chat. We'll do our best to help. We're going to begin this week with a very, very simple beginner chord tip. Um, this came up on what I think we mentioned on, on our members live stream recently. Um, and by the way, if you want to become an NGA member, that reminds me, let me add the banner onto the screen. Um, if you want to become an NGA member, you can do so by scanning that code right there in the bottom corner with your phone. That will take you through to the sign up page where you can become an NGA member. Um, and um, yeah, so what I wanted to share today was a very, very simple beginner guitar tip. But if you don't know this, then it's going to be super helpful. Adam, I'm just going to bump you to the side while we display this. All right, very, very quickly, I want people to realize if you're a beginner guitarist and you're just maybe just playing open chords, remember the guitar world in terms of chords, kind of divided into two. You have open chords that we play down here. They usually happen in the first three frets of the guitar. This is where most of the open chords happen. Chords like E minor, chords like C, G, D, yeah, all of those things. And then the sort of once we cr cross the threshold of being able to play bar chords, then you know all of these other chords open up for us, and all of a sudden we're playing you know higher up the neck. We can move all over the guitar. But to begin with, we're kind of stuck down at this end. That's just how it is. 
To make that more interesting, I just wanted to point out to anybody who doesn't already know this, that you can hammer on nearly, not every single note, but most of the notes that you play down at that end of the guitar, you can hammer on those notes. So for example, with an E chord, yeah, if we hammer on, that's when we pluck once, but then we hammer on with our finger like this. So what happens when we do that is we pluck once, but we hear two pitches, yeah? So it's a great way that you can get something like, instead of just playing the chord like that, you can add in some hammer-ons. So you can get a more of an interesting kind of tone going. Yeah, when you play a D chord, nearly all of those notes can be hammered on. An A chord. Yeah, and you can pull them away too. So what happens is when you play in those chords, Okay, now for anyone who is an intermediate guitarist, they're like, duh, yeah, of course, that's a really obvious, simple tip. But if you're a beginner guitarist, that's gonna blow your mind. I was amazed when I learned that, that I could get all of this extra musicality and depth out of chords that I already know, that I already knew. So not every note can be hammered on or pulled off, but lots of them can. So please play around with that if you're a beginner guitarist. It's a great way to sound more musical. It makes you kind of like sound a bit flash, you know, than makes you sound better than you actually are, <laughs> which I really enjoyed when I was a beginner. It was nice to have that little leg up, you know. Um, so there we go. That's a very quick beginner guitar tip for you. Can I add uh, on that really quick for you? Yeah, go on. for it. Yeah, man. So everybody, when you're trying this technique, try to be conscious of the notes that are around that chord. So if we're looking at E major chord, for example, like Mike just demonstrated with that. We know that we can hammer on to that note, that uh, that E note on the D string, second fret, because the note behind it is D open, right? And we know if we are studying our chords, we know that the notes around that that are available are the open D string and also the open A string. So you can even, if you really want to get fancy about it, you can do something like... those notes and try to explore where those notes exist around your chords especially in the open position if you can find an yeah. open note to hammer on to a fretted note do it you get that blues sound like right yeah, away Yeah, absolutely and like you know glenn says there about it being like johnny cash like johnny cash was an absolute master of that i mean to be honest okay. a, a lot of sort of blues folk country guys like they absolutely nuke hammer-ons and pull-offs you know like that's one of the ways that they get that you know, like that travis picking thing we were talking about the other week that's the sound but you know a lot of that sound comes from those little chord like flicks hammer-ons and pull-offs that we do super cool i love that technique yeah um, the only thing is every beginner who ever learns them ends up overusing them <laughs> because like uh, playing the blues after a while you're yeah good. yeah because they're like they're so like they they discover this new technique they're like wow hammer-ons it's like it sounds cool they start playing around with it and then all of a sudden like they can't play a chord without like just like covering it in hammer-ons you know it's like so it's one of those things i think where you have to learn it but then you actually want to ease back on it and use them more tastefully like but to begin with just have fun with it and play them everywhere yeah and once you learn bar chords start listening to some r b guitar and you're going to hear that stuff again everywhere just fretted up yes. right so this yeah. is a recyclable technique that you can use at every single level and at a yeah. certain point, it stops sounding like blues and it can start sounding like other things as well, depending upon what you're listening to and what you're trying to emulate. But yeah, great tip, Mike. Thanks, man. Yeah, very, very helpful. Um, okay, we've got a good question here from Rick. Rick said, please tell us the difference between a Telecaster and a Nashville Tele. Well, put very simply, Rick, a Nashville, uh, sorry, a Telecaster, you know, is one of the most famous guitar designs of all. I would say, you know, like in the pantheon of great guitars, you've got, you know, a Stratocaster, a Telecaster, a Les Paul, a 335. Does anything else make it into the pantheon of great all-time guitars, Adam? Is it just those four, do you think? Yeah, like the Strat, the S335, the Telecaster, uh, yeah. you know, your standard Dreadnought acoustic. Yeah. And yeah, they the... Sorry, yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, they're, they're to me like the great, you know, like the classic shapes. I know there's loads of others, but they're the main ones, I think. I call that the songwriter's classic. I guess that's the joke that I make with everybody is like, I have the songwriter's classic array in terms of like, 
yeah. what I use. I have my AS335, my Strat. I have uh, two baritones, three acoustics, and a Telecaster. And the, the only real difference between a regular Telecaster and a Nashville Telecaster, there's two, technically there's two types. Mike has a Nashville player Telecaster, which is a Telecaster with, I think, three single coil pickups in it. And that is an iteration of a Telecaster done by Fender, an actual Nashville guitar, which is, I think, what you're referring to. I'll demonstrate in just a second, but essentially it's a Telecaster or any other guitar that has a set of Nashville strings on it. And the Nashville oh, strings- Oh yeah, I didn't even think about- Yeah, four strings yeah. on the octave up, the E, the A, the D, the G, and then two regular gauged strings for the B and the E. So you're getting like a pseudo 12 string sound. I've got mine here. I'll just plug it in. Give me a second, yeah. give a quick so, so yeah, so okay. So let me explain that a little bit more just in case anybody's confused by that. A Telecaster is basically, it's one of Fender's like top selling guitar designs. It's got two pickups in it, okay? but a Nashville telly has three. So it's really, really unusual. It's kind of not a telly in lots of ways. A Telecaster has two pickups. A Nashville Telecaster has three. Totally separately to that, a completely separate issue is you can tune your guitar, any guitar, to Nashville tuning, which is what Adam's about to demonstrate. So a Nashville Telecaster is completely separate to Nashville tuning. They're two distinct things. A Nashville Telecaster is the Telecaster with three pickups. Nashville tuning has got strings that are on it in a higher octave, which makes the guitar sound really twinkly and interesting. It's a really nice way to add additional guitar to something because it will complement and harmonize beautifully with like guitar track one. So if you've got a friend and you want to jam with them, one of you could play in with a standard guitar in standard tuning, and then the other one could play with a guitar in Nashville tuning, and you start getting all these twinkly, amazing harmonies. It sounds so nice. As Adam is about to demonstrate, so quick backstory on this too of why we actually got into knowing all of this is a little bit ago i think at the beginning of 2023 we partnered up with our friends at diderio and company if you don't know who diderio are they are a fantastic guitar string and accessory company we did some content with them around finding the perfect guitar string gauge the video is available on our youtube channel the written lesson lesson is available on the website and when the live stream is over i'll make sure both of those links are in the description now diderio were very kind to us and they sent us a huge box of guitar strings. I, it was epic. It was, it was epic. So you <laughs> I have so many stories about what I've done with this box of strings. <laughs> Honestly, Mike, it's gonna blow your mind. Yeah. Uh, but after that, they're like, you know, is there anything else that you guys would really want to experiment with just on the side? And I said to them, I was like, yeah, I'd really love to try a set of Nashville strings. They said, sure, no problem. Very kind of them. Big shout out to our friends at Diderio. Thank you so much. Yeah, they're and, awesome. Uh, yeah. And so I ended up going out, I was working on a country project at the time um, that I'm actually just finishing up at the end of the year now. And I said to myself, I'm like, the guitars don't sound big enough. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to find myself the cheapest Squire Telecaster I could find. And I found this and I picked it up and I brought it into them and I said, put these strings on it. And this is what it ended up sounding like in the neck position. So again, like we explained, your bottom four strings are tuned an octave higher. Your B and your E string are just tuned like a regular b and an e what you get is this beautiful chimey type sound so we're going to use a g yeah make... let's hear it this one's tuned to e flat so i'm a half step below everybody else but and if we're going to use that technique mike was talking about before let's hear that over a g major chord So just to just to contrast Adam, just to contrast against that, if I'm playing the standard tune in here. I'll just mirror that uh, a fret up. Yeah. So you can hear how Adam's guitar sounds so much more chimey and inter it's almost like a different instrument. It almost sounds like a mandolin or a lute or something or a ukulele. You're getting those different harmonies, you're an octave higher. Um, but it pairs beautifully with with a standard guitar. So yeah. to go back to the original question, a Nashville Telecaster is a completely separate thing. That is a Telecaster that has one extra pickup and sounds amazing. I love my Player Plus Nashville Tele, one of my favorite guitars. As a separate thing, you've got Nashville Tuning, which we just demonstrated for you very much. Listen, we've got to shout out Martin. Moss is having fun with his Boss BD2 that arrived yesterday. I think we discussed this on a previous live stream. Nice. Martin, that's great to hear. I hope you hope you're digging that. Hope you're enjoying that very much. And um, we've got uh, primary tutor. Have you seen the new Gibson Les Paul models? I have not. 
Adam, have you seen the new Les Paul models? I have not, no. Dude, we need to check that out. We need Apparently to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, we Gibbs is doing some really interesting stuff right now. I know that they're, I know that their head of, <clears throat> uh, the head of Gibson is is doing a lot to, kind of you know I don't know push the company in a new direction. I know Marty Schwartz just got a signature ES three thirty five. Congratulations, no Marty. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Listen, I, I've got another another great question here from Stephen. He says, "Should I learn bar chords on electric or acoustic?" Well, Stephen, you can make. You can make an argument for either one. I think you'll have an easier time if you learn it on an electric guitar, just because generally the you know the strings are thinner and easier to press down. Um, but you can totally learn bar chords on an acoustic guitar. All I would say is make sure that you put extra light gauge strings on the guitar just to make that transition as easy as you can be. Moving from open chords to bar chords is the biggest hurdle that a guitarist faces. But once you make it to the other side of that hurdle, it's well worth it because it's almost like the guitar becomes a different instrument. Yeah, and that's really the moment I always say when, once you can play bar chords, I think that's when you can say, I can play the guitar. You know, that's the moment I think when you can say, yeah, yeah, I'm a guitarist. I can play the guitar. I'd agree. Um, Adam, do you think electric? It's going to be easier to learn bar chords on an electric guitar, isn't it, than acoustic because the necks are slightly thinner, the strings are easier to press down. Yeah, I think so. So long as that your so long as your action is taken care of, like the distance from the strings to the fretboard is so that it's not so severe. And if you are working with a guitar yeah. like that right now and you are finding it frustrating to play, go to your local music store, ask for their in-house guitar tech and say that you need a setup, that your action needs to be lowered. Again, the action is this distance from the strings to the fretboard. Yeah. Now, um, I'm the type of musician that likes to punish. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Exactly. I'm the type of musician that likes to punish himself when he learns things. So I learn everything on the acoustic, but that doesn't mean that you should. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for you to learn it on the electric. However, there is one caveat, and that is that if you're learning bar chords on the acoustic, your hands are going to become adept to those chords a lot quicker because transitioning from an electric guitar to an acoustic guitar, especially when you're a beginner, can get a little bit difficult. So I'd say if you have both, try them on both, but try to really like work them out on the electric guitar and then practice them practice your your fingering the fretting of that on an acoustic guitar you're going to build your calluses a lot quicker and you'll yeah. just be able to do them on both yeah do but i mean certainly practice on both if you've got an acoustic at home just yeah. practice on everything stephen you know like the more you practice the the, the the faster you'll get there great question from gary have you guys thought of having an instagram page where you just go live whenever you feel like playing your guitar to hang out with the audience on instagram we have started posting on instagram at yeah. last like I've I've been dragged kicking and screaming into the year 2023 <laughs> by my <laughs> by Adam. Uh, we have actually started posting stuff on there. Um, yeah, Gary, I didn't know you could just like. Oh no, actually, I did know that you can you could just go live on there. But yeah, I suppose we could just like randomly just go live and just hang out and have a jam without it being like a big a big thing. That might be cool. Thanks for the idea. Live live is everything right now. That's what social media wants to see. And for the record, Mike, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Yeah, it, it wasn't easy. I know. Like, you know, I'm still. It's, it's to okay. Be honest. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. But like, <laughs> from, from it's funny because Mike and I not only come from completely different backgrounds in music and our kind of musical training, they also come from completely different backgrounds as marketers, too. So yeah. moving into the new social media age, like, it was, you know, I totally see where you were coming from with it, too, right? Yeah. It's cool because we're seeing all these beautiful people now coming in. There's so it is cool. Yeah. So many people in the, men in the membership program now. We're posting every day on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. Yeah, so we're everywhere all of a sudden, aren't we? Go follow us. Again, at the end, all the links will be in the description. Yeah, go on TikTok as well. I haven't got a bloody clue what's happening on there, but go over there and watch us on TikTok. We're I'm growing. Just... We're growing slowly. <laughs> we're growing slowly, but the TikTok algorithm hates everybody. Yeah, and I, I've just no idea what's happening there. There's just like mad videos of like cats, people dancing, and like I'm just mashing buttons on there. It's like some type of sci-fi nightmare. I've got no idea what's <laughs> happening on TikTok. <laughs> um, Rick said, "Is it worth the extra money to buy the Nashville telly versus the regular telly?" Rick, I, I, I honestly, I, if you only had the choice to get one, I probably would get the Nashville telly just because you've got more options sonically yeah. for where you can go. You can get in between tones because. If you've got three pickups, then you've got five different positions on the neck, which gives you more variety as an instrument. Um, but if you just want to get a Telecaster, you know, if I had to pick my favorite guitar, it would be a Telecaster, just a plain old standard Telecaster. That is my favorite guitar. So, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with just buying yourself a standard Tele. I think they're, the, like, they're my favorite guitars. Um, but certainly, if you want to get a Nashville Tele, that's absolutely fine, dude. 
if you if it's your first electric guitar i, I one of the reasons i i favor telecasters is, is for their simplicity so if it's your very first electric guitar i think a telly is a great place to begin because it's just got two pickups it's really it's it's quite a straightforward instrument to use if you contrast that against some other guitars that have three pickups five different neck posi uh, posi um, pickup selections that you can have plus if you get something like a 335 where you've got two sets of tone and volume controls there's just too many variables for a beginner it's like oh god how do i get a good tone out of this thing and your tone really matters when you're learning if you don't sound good then you get demoralized you know and dispirited and that stops you from practicing as much i had so I, with this guitar this was my this was my yeah. first electric that i owned that wasn't like handed down to me and i had yeah. that problem a lot as well i mean like i ended up switching up pickups later on and stuff like that once i got a bit more keen to the electronics but yeah two tone yeah. knobs two volume knobs and you're <laughs> time learning how to like blend this, things together yeah so these like, are very it, straightforward exactly like if you've just come from playing an acoustic guitar it's just a piece of wood with a hole in then go into playing something like what you have there adam like it's like oh my god what's happening here you know it's a lot for sure great question from drew any thoughts on an acoustic simulator pedal hotone omni uh, are they worth the money time or effort um drew i generally hate acoustic simulator pedals just because i've never really found one that i really like i'm sure that there are good ones out there in the world i've never managed to find one i just play a clean tone on my electric guitar if i want to get an acoustic feel or I just put a microphone in front of my actual acoustic guitar. I think the the tone of an acoustic guitar, the tone of an acoustic guitar and the tone of like a driven amp with, you know, they're my two favorite guitar tones of all. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I can't get behind acoustic simulator pedals. That's just my experience. Adam, what do you think? I'll give you one better than an acoustic simulator pedal. I have been trying for years to find one that works. Um, yeah. just because like when I used to play live, it was a lot of switching between electric. Exactly. Music. Yeah. I was a live looper. So like, you know, I would be on stage with three different guitars. I have my Strat, I have my 335 and I have my yeah. stick and I was constantly switching them out and like hitting keys to switch cables and this type of thing. It's very difficult, but I will tell you one thing. Fender has made something called, I believe it's the Acousta Sonic. Yeah. Uh, I tried it last year. Did you? Yeah. I've, yeah. I've tried one as well. It, and that, it was good. Yeah, it strikes the balance between an acoustic guitar, the feel of the acoustic guitar and the resonance, and an yeah. electric guitar. And it's also available as a Telecaster. The thing that you're going to have the most trouble with, and even in 2023, when we have all of this technology, and I speak as somebody whose rig is entirely, and I mean entirely digital, I do not own an amplifier. Actually, I have one, but it's like a 15-watt Marshall, and it's sitting in my basement. And my like Line 6 Spider 2 is still at my mom's house in her basement. But... Um, even in this age of like digital amplification and modeling that we're in, yeah, there it is. Uh, oh, yeah, the offset, the Jazzmaster version is so much nicer. Um, we're still not really able to model acoustics. And the reason for that is because you need a big piece of wood with a big hole in the middle of it that's going to let all that resonance swim around inside it. The closest thing you can get is a 335, like what I have here. Yeah. It's a PVJF1 EXP. Um, or you can get an Acousta Sonic. And I will say that like from my experience, Fender has struck that balance better than anybody else. And they're yeah, also so, now forcing a lot of people to try and keep up with them. It's kind of fun to watch. Yeah, well, I think that's why Gibson are having to get with the program because Fender have raised the game, I think, with trying new ideas and new concepts in, in, in recent years. They're paying um, good attention to what we're all looking for, for sure. I, I agree. It's nice to see that because both of those two companies were just dinosaurs for years. And I feel like, you know, things are starting to happen. You know, they're yeah. actually trying things and being creative and, you know, and trying to modernize, which I think is good. That's what we want um, to see. What I would say, Drew, is... Um, I have never found a good acoustic simulator pedal. Has anybody, has anybody who's watching the stream right now, if you found a great acoustic simulator pedal, please drop it in the chat because I'd love to find one. That would be amazing, you know, so you could get an acoustic tone from an electric guitar. Um, but in my experience, I haven't come across that. The Acousta Sonic to me, Adam, um, I, I know I've seen people online playing them and they sound great. Um, but to me, it was not as good as an acoustic guitar and oh. it wasn't as good as an electric guitar. So it was yeah. kind, you know, it was kind of. But if if you really required, if like if you could only take one guitar to a gig, um, you could absolutely get brilliant tones out of it. There was, there was some lovely tones to be had. Yeah. But because it's I, thing. sorry, mate, say again. It's its own. It's its own thing for sure. Yeah. You know, but it is. Yeah. It is still like you know, it's kind of just down down the middle. But I feel that though. I mean, you're not. 
with an instrument like that, you're not going to get like, the feel of an electric or the feel of an acoustic, but you're yeah, going they're two different to things, yeah. Blend right, so maybe it's just its own thing. Uh, yeah, 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 and and also like even though I wasn't really bowled over with it, I I, I love that they made it. You know, it's so cool that, that I like that they're trying things. You know, yeah, let's do Try. this, man. With all the technology that we have nowadays. Why are we just reissuing guitars that came out in the 1950s? <laughs> Let's try Ivan, some stuff. Ivan as and Tim Henson from Polyphia did that too. If you haven't listened to Polyphia yet, everybody, please go listen to them. Listen to Playing God. Okay. Yeah, this is one of the best like progressive track. rock metal bands out there right now. No vocalists, just guitars, uh, drums and bass, and synths and all that. But Tim Henson uh, from Polyphia, the story goes, is that he's endorsed with Ibanez. And one day he was going through a pawn shop somewhere in L.A. Or, or somewhere else, and he found an old Ibanez nylon string electric guitar. And he called them up and he said, what's this about? I've never seen this before. They said, oh, that was like a one-off thing that we did in the 90s or the 80s or something like that. And he turned around and he said, okay, I want a signature guitar that's a nylon string, electric guitar scale length, electric guitar string spacing, nylon strings and the ability to project all of that. And they did it and they created what is called the Tim Henson TOD, Tree of Death. And uh, I've played it. It's amazing. I want one so bad. <laughs> Very that's cool. That's innovation too, right? Bringing nylon string instruments onto electric guitar. That's not really something that we've seen before. So if yeah. you want to hear what that sounds like, go listen to Playing God by Polyphia. Yeah, that is an amazing track. Um, great comment here from Glenn. He said, I like to think learning to play guitar on an acoustic is like learning to drive a manual shift vehicle. It's the harder of the two. If you can drive a standard, an auto is usually a piece of cake. <laughs> I don't <laughs> it's drive good, manual. <laughs> it's, it's a good analogy, Glenn, isn't it? It's like if you can yeah. drive if you can drive a manual, driving an auto is easy. I mean, in the UK, it's mostly manual here. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. Do you, drive, uh, do you drive stick? No, not stick now. Stick. I don't, but 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 it, but the... Um, like in the UK, it's, it's, it, it's the amount of people that drive autos increases each year in the UK. Right. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, you just automatics weren't a thing. Now they're becoming more of a thing. Interesting. Um, yeah, but I think for you guys on the other side of the Atlantic, I think it's the other way around, isn't it? Autos yeah. are the main, the main type for you guys. Oh, it's the, it's the car nuts over here that are all driving like stick shift. And oh, I, can't, really? I can't even imagine an entire city of people who drive stick shift <laughs> move out of that city so fast. Come to, yeah, come to England, mate. Go to Liverpool, go to London. You'll find plenty of people driving stick, as you call it. We just oh, call, them, we call them manuals. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we call them manual <laughs> stick shift and, you know, all that. Yeah. Um, yeah everybody. Fine. Thank you so much for all these comments. I, I literally can't keep up with them all. I'm sorry there's so many coming through, but it's great it's awesome. great to see them. Thank you very much. A couple of things that we wanted to share with you before we go any further. Number one, I've got a gadget that I want to share with you, and that is, um, or it's more of a, it's an accessory, and it's this stuff. Now, you may be familiar with this, and you may not. Let me put it here on the, on the got, got it queued up on the iPad. This is called Dual Lock Tape. Now, this is, um, it's like, it's like, Adam, do you guys have Velcro? Do you call it Velcro or do you call it like hook and loop? What do you call it over in Canada? Like tape that sticks together? Velcro. Yeah. Velcro. And this is, this is the most important investment anybody with an affinity for pedals will ever make. Yeah, dude. Like if you're, a, if you're a guitarist, then having sticky stuff that sticks things together, but not permanently is really, really useful for just like moving things around, making them secure. Now you can absolutely just use plain old Velcro. That's fine. I used that for 20 years. Um, but last year I tried out this stuff, the, um, the 3M dual lock tape. Now this is like, it's, I don't know if you can see it, if the fidelity is high enough for you to see it, but it's basically like, it's more rigid type of Velcro. Um, and you can kind of fasten and unfasten it, but it's, it's basically, it's, it's like really, really good quality Velcro that's rigid and lasts for ages and you really don't need very much of it. Um, it's revolutionized my guitar pedal board um, just because, like I say, it's it sort of holds stuff more firmly in place than traditional Velcro. Really, really useful. I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. Adam, do you use that or do you just use plain old Velcro? Uh, I, I don't use, actually, I'm, I don't know if what I have is 3M. Uh, the Walmart over here in my neck of the woods. I don't know if you guys, do you have, have Walmart in the UK? No. It's called it's called Asda here. Oh yeah, there's Asda, a company okay. called Walmart. They bought a supermarket here, Asda, and then just oh, started so. piling the shelves high with like. That's you know, how they got. Pile to them it. high, sell them low. Yeah, well that's it. But um, yeah, I bought this big box of Velcro a couple of years ago, um, and it was like super high grade, like very sticks together very well. 
I'll tell you something. I, I wish I could pull my camera down, but my Helix, um, like the modeling effects unit that I have, which is about like this big, uh, wide, it's got these four little feet on the bottom of it. And I couldn't figure out a way to stick this to my pedal board without taking the feet off. So what I did is I cut four little squares and I put them underneath each of the feet. And I put that on my pedal board and I tested it out. I turned it upside down again, four little squares. That was it. And this thing did not budge and it hasn't budged since. Yeah. One thing that you have to do, if you're going to get Velcro for a pedal board or whatever other application you're going to use it for, make sure it's heavy duty by 3M when you can, because 3M is the best. Um, yeah, it is good yeah. quality. It's more expensive, I think, than the other stuff, but it, it is it is good quality. It just means that you can keep your pedal board more organized all the yeah. time, too. Like, yeah. you don't have things just kind of floating around. Yeah. They're and not it's, stuck down. They're just all over the place. Exactly. It's a mess, especially if you, if you, I mean, with anything, but if you're using something like a loop pedal where you're pressing it a lot, yeah. you know, it, need, it needs to be secure, but you also need the ability to be able to reconfigure the pedal board. Yeah. Um, Paul Gray asks, what does Lindsey Buckingham play? Do you know what? I don't know. Does he have like a certain type of guitar that he plays? Lindsey Buckingham from Fleetwood Mac? I'm not sure, actually. I've seen, him playing, I've seen him playing 12 string acoustics. I've seen him playing... I can't picture it. Yeah, if anybody knows, like, does Lindsey Buckingham favor a certain type of guitar? Please post it in the chat. Uh, that would be good to know. Um, everybody, before we move on, I just wanted to um, point out that you can become an NGA member right now. Um, the link to join is in the bottom corner of the screen there. If you scan that link, that will take you over to the membership sign-up page. If you are enjoying this live stream, please subscribe to the channel. We're closing in on 40,000 subscribers. Uh, we would love to get there before Christmas. That is our plan. Um, right, Adam, it's time, dude. We've got to discuss oh, no. the brand new Beatles song. It's time. <laughs> the Beatles released a brand new song today called Now and Then. Um, it debuted like in the an hour and a half ago uh, it was a big deal here it was on the radio it was on the tv and uh, and everything else everybody uh, anyone who's here in the chat please let us know what did you think of the new beatles song what was your reaction <laughs> what do you think how did it affect you um it's not what i expected it is not what i expected at all i thought it would be i don't know a bit more poppy and a bit more upbeat and it's kind of like haunting and sad and like um, yeah, like sort of begins in A minor. Um, it's like, and just hearing John Lennon's like voice, the way they've like, they used AI to separate his voice from the recording. So there was a recording that they had of him playing this song in 1978. He was playing it at the piano at his house, I think in the Dakota building, I think was where it was recorded. Um, but they could never use it because they couldn't separate his voice from the, the piano. And it was a really poor quality recording. It was just like, remember those old tape players where you'd like have to press with two fingers, you'd have to press like play and record at the same time to, so like the, the, the quality of the recording was really bad. But with all the new modern technology that they have now, they've managed to separate John Lennon's vocal completely from the, from the piano that he was playing. And then of course, with all the modern tools, you know, compression and EQ and God knows what else, they've managed to flesh out and build that vocal. So it, um, so it carries. See, that's um, why I want to listen to it. Is it specifically for that, for the stem separation? Um, yeah. If anybody doesn't know, when, in the audio world, um, we refer to the individual audio tracks when they're all delivered to you as stems uh, or multi-tracks, depending upon the context. But I think in this in this case, it'd be more referred to as stems. But that's the wild thing to me about all of this now. And it's nice to yeah. see, because I mean, like there's been so many goofy uses of AI in music. I mean, seeing people bootleg Drake somebody released a Drake song just using AI and like a 21 Savage song. So it's nice to see a band doing justice to one of their, you know, uh, deceased members, uh, rest in peace. Um, and, you know, doing that for some, for some good to maybe shed some light onto the world because everybody loves the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love the Beatles, man? They're, they are the best band ever for me by, by some distance, you know, there's a lot, everyone else is fighting it out for the second spot in my opinion. Um, John said, I cried when I heard it, tears of joy and sadness that he's no longer here. Yeah, I had a similar reaction, John. I didn't actually cry, but like, I felt like I was going to, you know, it was like um, just, you know, just hearing a brand new song being sung by John Lennon. It did affect me very much. You know, I absolutely adore the Beatles. Um, I got so many deep connections to them throughout, you know, my life. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary said, just made me sad. There's only two of them left. 
and the other ones went way too early. They absolutely did. I could, couldn't agree more, Gary, but damn, they made an impact in the time that they had. Um, so cool. Yeah, so cool to hear a new song um, from them. We're going to be doing a YouTube video shortly uh, showing you how to play that. Um, if anybody's yeah. interested in that, keep your eyes peeled. That will be coming really soon. Just, uh, um, just back up for one second, too, before we move forward. I know somebody, yeah, go on, mate. somebody just mentioned this in here. Um, one of the guitars that Lindsey Buckingham was best known for was a Rick Turner Model 1 DLXC. Uh, and it looks like that there. And apparently, if I go into Google, that's the first thing that served me. And I think uh, Baz, Cook, Baz, Cook? Baz Cook just said that he looked up his signature Turner. Yeah, that would be the same one. 4,737 pounds. <laughs> How much? 4,737 pounds and 45 cents. That's uh, it's pretty cheap. Come on. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you just pay cash and walk out with it. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah, no problem. No worries at all um okay la lastly on the list of things i wanted us to hit on today was um adam we've got to discuss the joe pass guitar book oh man. right now anybody who has been following our work for a while knows that adam has this book that is often next to him on the live streams and people often ask like what is this book like you can see it in the background there it is so this week i bought the joe pass guitar chords book and i opened it up and I read through it for about half an hour and I was just like, what the hell is this book? <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't know, this is this is a this is more of an advanced guitarist thing. If you're a beginner, don't worry about this at all. But Joe Pass is like a famous virtuoso jazz legend, Adam. Yes. Is that probably the best yes. way to describe him? Yeah. And this book that he's uh, that's it's a very famous book. I've heard it mentioned many times over the years by advanced guitarists as being almost like a Bible, you know, of like, you know, special chords or secret Perhaps. chords or something like that. So inside the book, there are lots of different chords and it doesn't tell you what any of the chords are. So it's just like really like difficult to play chord shapes with no guidance other than this is major or like it just literally says these are major tones. These yeah. are minor. You know, these are dominant sevens. These are minor seven flat fives, whatever, augmented okay. and diminished chords. And that's it. So like, and I, I, I sent Adam a message after an hour of like, just my mind being blown by this book. I was like, Adam, what the hell is this book? What is the point? How do I use it? Um, so Adam, why don't you just let anybody know? Cause I'm at the point where this Joe Pass book is almost about, it's, it may, it's this close to going in the bin. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> what the hell is this thing? <laughs> it's a slow burn of book for sure. For, for anyone else who's on the call, who is interested in going really deep and learning advanced guitar chords, Adam, this is your chance to like, tell them why the Joe Pass book is, is, is useful. Like yeah. how it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Why shouldn't it go in the bin? <laughs> <laughs> Why shouldn't it go in the bin? Yeah. That's a great question, man. Cause I mean, like when I first picked up this book, when I was in college, I, I was telling Mike before we got on the live stream, um, we had a bunch of like required reading when I went to, I attended Mohawk college for two years in Hamilton, Ontario. I saw Martin. I said, thought, I think he said he was from steel city. Uh, if you don't know, that is Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Um, and uh, Chris, Christine has a kind of interesting point. It's for visual learners. Yeah, kind of, but not quite that. Um, so essentially what Joe Pass did is he had this theory that if you just see the chord shapes and you play them, you're going to be training your ears on the different intervals that are in those chords. Then when you go to do something like songwriting, for example, your ears are more open to these different types of intervals, just these different chord qualities. So you're not going to see a lot of just major and minor straightaway chords in here. And you're also not going to see a lot of root notes. And one thing you will see none of are chord names. The chord qualities will be told to you, but it's up to you to figure out how those chords fit in with those qualities. The purpose of this is to train your ears on intervals instead of just training your ears on chords. Because we play a C major chord, we play a G major chord, we play a C minor chord. We know how those look, we know how those sound. But we're just looking at them in terms of their shapes. We're not looking at it and saying, oh, in a G major chord, I have G as my one, <clears throat> is my three, and I have a D as my five. This book is intended to be paired with theory and ear training in order to really get you ahead um, when it comes to different chords and chord qualities. Now, that sounds completely overwhelming to anybody who's watching this, but the thing is, is that this book is a slow burn you cannot expect anything from it on the first day that you open it. You cannot expect anything on the second. 
what you yeah. do is you go through, you play all of these chords, and then you go back and you look at your fretboard. Get yourself a nice little diagram of the fretboard in the key of C major, and then you look for those shapes. And you say, oh, this shape that I was playing on page three, it actually fits in at like the eighth fret here. Oh, interesting. Why is that? Go back to your fretboard diagram, look at the notes, and say, what notes are in this chord in this key of C major? Analyze them. Realize that there are intervallic ways in which that they blend together, and you will start to see the chord qualities themselves, right? Again, so very like very convoluted explanation. But. Yeah, no, no, it, it, I, I, it, I think it's a, it's a great explanation, Adam. I think for my, for me, it's just like as a guitar teacher, yeah, I so, just can't get my head around the idea of giving somebody chords to play and not telling them what they are. But yeah. I'm I'm into the idea of like trying something new. You know, so I, I'm not, it's not going in the bin yet. Don't worry. Like, I'm, you know, like I'm going to sit and, you know, explore it a bit more. I really like the idea of like, of focusing on your ears because I've seen in the past as a musician, just how terrible my ear, my ears were for a long time and your ears can be trained. And yeah. by the way, everybody, if you're not, if you don't realize this, you know, being able to listen and hear intervals, it's a really cool skill for a musician to have. Yeah. but nobody's born with it you have to actually practice it and then when you've got that skill it's so so useful so i'm down for that adam i like the idea of like training your ears more i just feel like for me at the moment it's kind of impenetrable you know like i can't yeah. I can, do you know what i mean it is impenetrable and don't don't yeah. feel weird about and anybody that picks up this book don't feel weird <laughs> in the first week Baz says mike does not look <laughs> he's not He's not. I tried to explain this on the membership live stream last week. <laughs> like, no, just yeah. no. <laughs> but yeah. you know, it is. It's a convoluted book. Um, Gary Westcott says it sounds like a puzzle, but without the picture to copy it from. And yeah, you're absolutely correct. I'm going to give you guys a quick two second example, you guys and gals, sorry, um, of you know what this book has done for me. So I love what we call parallel motion in chords. I love to take one chord, one chord shape and then find the different spots across the fretboard that I can use it. Now, major six shape in the key of G major would look like this. And what I'm doing there is I'm just playing the highest fourth string. So on the D string with my index finger, I'm playing the second fret. I'm playing the fourth fret with my pinky finger on the G string, and then the third fret on the B and the E string. This is a major six chord quality with no root on the bottom. It just sounds like a major six. But there are multiple spots on the fretboard that we can use this chord. So if I go. Ah, now this chord shape fits in two spots on the fretboard. Yeah. Interesting. So if we move that up two more frets. That's a chord progression. That actually resolves down on this major six on the bottom. Uh, and it's funny because if you start to listen, you will hear what root note you want to hear on the bottom of it. So if I just play, we're starting on that E. E is the relative minor of G major. So we have all those top notes there from G major, but we've got a couple in the middle here and we can root this on E. So we go. second chord on C and then we can the third chord on D now you'll see that that's not an easy chord to play especially when you're sliding it yeah. around getting your practice in and finding out where that chord pops up this is so good for you and the thing is too bossa nova yes bass cook absolutely um was one of my favorite styles to play is bossa because it's just nice and flowy there's a lot you can do with it. There's a lot of room to play. But one more time. So we root this first chord on the E. And it's interesting because this is a major six shape. But we're using the relative minor of G major, right? So there's a lot that you can unpack here. And we're not going to go into a theoretical deep dive right now. But what I will yeah. say is, you know, I, I'm pretty sure there's sample pages that you can find online. Go grab one and just play a couple yeah, chords. Well the good thing is, is that the actual book, the Joe Pass book, it was only something, it was about four quid. You know, it's yeah. a really, it's a really cheap book. What I would say is 
obviously if you're a beginner guitarist don't worry about this stuff at all like no. just, just run in the opposite direction to all of this as far but as if, fast as you can <laughs> yeah so flames are coming from your heels like just run away but if you are an intermediate guitarist and you're looking to glimpse you know more advanced stuff um then there are some cool chord voices in there you know i was loving that like um you know that sixth chord shape like like dude that is so good Six. like yeah. how nice is that it's and this is the thing that i love about it it's not you don't want to take from the whole book all at once you want to take a couple of chords and you want to say yeah. how does this apply to what i already know and then you mix that in and the thing that i yeah. think that i've that's where i sorry from, adam that's where yeah. i went wrong like yeah. that's where i went wrong was like i was trying all different chords and like yeah. some of them sounded amazing but they were super hard to play and in the end my mind was just blown but i think what you said to me this morning was right i think that's an important point to make to everybody buy the book and just 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 sit with one or two of the chords and just play around with it for half an hour i think that's the way to access the book i think that's that's what i'm going to do tonight i think it's just like yeah. choose one chord and just zone in on it yeah, and make it relative to the other things that you play. I mean, it's funny. The biggest benefit that I've gotten from this is when, when I've been working with vocalists because hearing all these different intervals, this doesn't even apply to the guitar half the time in terms of where my ear is at. I'll hear, I'll play a basic major or minor chord, and then I'll tell the vocalist to sing those upper extensions of that chord. Now you've got something beautiful where you're playing a very rootsy chord progression underneath the vocalist and you're giving him or her the ability to get up and above and sing into that different range and color those chords differently and that synergy that you get between two instruments the voice and the guitar that's beautiful this is the thing is about this this book is that it's it looks like a book for jazz players but really it's a book for musicians no i think that's where i'll leave you with that but yeah joe yeah. pass guitar chords it's a great book it's like yeah. eight dollars canadian can't go wrong if you're an intermediate guitarist and you want to get into some more advanced stuff, go and check out the Joe Pass Guitar Chords book and then report back. Like, come back next week and tell me, is it in the bin? Or have your eyes and ears been open to some new, you know, possibilities? Yeah. I did, I, I, like, my, my initial reaction to the book not having, not telling you what the chords are was like, what the hell? Yeah, you're but, but I, Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then, but then I do also sort of quite like the bravery of that you know it's quite confronting i think for a teacher to, to be like no this is on you you yeah. know like you need to go away and figure this you know i, I quite like that you know That's so Ross told me too in college they were like you're gonna look at this and your mind's gonna melt in half and then you're gonna look at it again and you're gonna go oh, wait a minute something's familiar here and then after about the third or fifth day you're gonna go oh shoot there's something in here for me and yeah. it's it's fantastic but nevertheless like michael says if you are a beginner monty python with the rabbit run away <laughs> yeah and like baz just said that it does have great comments on amazon you know like the people like certainly the people who have got the value from this book they really did get the value from it so i know there's something there um, and the only reason why i'm persevering with it at all is just because i've heard so many people speak highly of it you know um so yes i will certainly i'll keep going don't worry I, i'm gonna keep going and see where we get to yeah, sure uh, everybody i love it everybody please um put your um oh here we go with bass says one of the most important guitarist books of the 20th century yeah that's the kind of language that gets used about the book baz that's why i got it so it's like there's obviously something important here um guys guys and girls before we run out of time if you've got anything you'd like us to discuss if you're struggling with anything if you've got any questions about your guitars um we've covered some advanced stuff today but please know beginner stuff is absolutely welcome here the conversation has just sort of naturally gone in that direction but if you've got any simple beginner questions please feel free to ask them um, we love helping beginner guitarists just as much as we love helping advanced guitarists. So please don't feel excluded from any of these conversations. That's right. Um, and um, the other thing I wanted to say was if you want to go and become an NGA member, you can scan that link in the bottom corner there. Five reasons to become an NGA member. Number one, if you join NGA, you get your own customized guitar learning plan, which is called Guitar Metrics. It's a personalized guitar learning plan that's customized just to you. Number two, you get access to our forum our amazing community of members which is just epic it's so great to see what the things that happen in there this um all the time this week we've started an nga song club um which is super exciting i can't wait to see where this leads that basically we're going to pick a song uh each month i'm not sure if we're going to do a beginner and an intermediate song or just a beginner song um but basically we will all be focused on that so a bit like a book club 
but it's a song club you know so we'll all be working on this track together sharing comments we can we can cover it in the members live stream adam like give people tips for the things that they're struggling with with that song um i'm really excited to to, to do that it's like it's just like a community project very yeah. cool and this um, was recommended actually by one of our members and this is the really big key thing that we want to push to you all as well where the membership is concerned is that this is a community that is formed and built by you and your needs right we've seen a lot of communities of music over the years where people turn around and they say here's all this set stuff and you can come and you can learn it all and blah 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 but that doesn't really answer the question of how do i learn the guitar how do i learn the guitar because my method i mean if you've been on the live stream before you know that mike and i are in two completely different worlds when it comes to our approach to music but we come together on the music itself and yeah. everybody is like that everybody's going to have a different approach our goal with the ngm membership program is to focus on your approaches so if there's something that you want to see you suggest it we do our best to make it happen yeah it is cool to see those things developing in the community oh, it really is it's very cool it's so um cool. great question here so blade said do all songs require set strumming patterns joined several days ago well number one blade welcome thank you for joining ng hey that's great news um no i i i tend i i really don't like strumming patterns blade i like people to not think about strumming patterns i like them to just learn the chords and then present it and develop their own musicality um the problem with learning set strumming patterns is you can get very one-dimensional um and people tend to repeat the strumming pattern on multiple songs and they can kind of get locked into a way of playing that lacks fluidity um but that said i know some people do like to have specific strumming patterns for certain songs so so yes there are certain songs that have unique strumming patterns um but as a general rule i don't think it's that useful to learn them i prefer people to just develop their own musicality um and i think if you if you don't have a set strumming pattern you know down down up down up all of that stuff um i i don't think that helps i think it's best to just think the strumming pattern is only ever down and up it's all it ever is and sometimes you don't actually make contact with the strings and that's how we can play and stay in time if you're always stopping what you play stopping and starting it's hard to stay in time it's hard to go it's hard to step out and rejoin in time if you're going down down stop and there's moments when your arm stops but there are some other like you know times so like one of the first songs that we always teach people is wonderwall so it's like so you do get moments there So Wonderwall is interesting because it does have a relatively unique strumming pattern in the way those chords are presented. Some of the chords begin with upstrokes, which is, you know, it's not unheard of. But generally, when you change chords in most pop music, that's happening on a downbeat, on sorry, on a downstroke, which is at the start of the sort of a beat. So if we change to a new chord in most pop songs, that's usually a downstroke. With Wonderwall, it's not; it's an upstroke. So. So there are times when a bespoke strumming pattern helps, but as a general rule, I think it's something you should avoid like the plague um, because I've just seen it happen with so many people, so many students. And just objectively, you know, you see so many people trying it one way versus trying another way. It's very clear which one wins um, when you watch enough people. Adam, what do you think about strumming patterns? I learn the chords first. Learn the chords first every single time, no matter what, because at the end of the day, Listen, it's music. You don't need to play it like Noel Gallagher. Yeah, if you if you learn Wonderwall like Noel Gallagher, it'll sound like Wonderwall. But at the same time, how many other ways could you take those chords and use them in different chord progressions? Yeah, and interpret learning, in your own way, yeah. Yeah, by learning that bespoke strumming pattern, like, yes, you are learning Wonderwall. And we actually, we have a YouTube short about this on our YouTube channel here as well. It's actually from a previous live stream where somebody asked, why don't you guys teach more songs in the courses? And the reason for that is because we want you to learn the chords and then we want you to be open to interpreting it. The one big thing I will say on the topic of strumming patterns is instead of just learning the strumming pattern, learn it if you want, but listen, listen to the song, really tap into what they're doing. You'll be able to visualize it after a while, but you got to listen to it. So if you're a vinyl head, put the record on. If you're digital like me, pull it up on Spotify, give it five or 10 listens through and ask yourself, what's this person doing? go pull up some youtube videos there's plenty of videos of oasis playing wonderwall everywhere on the internet and you'll yeah. be able to see it that way but remember too don't let that be the end of it by any circumstance learn the strumming pattern if you want learn the chords first and then take those chords and say where else can i go with this and once you learn a c add nine you've learned the beginning of about 150 different pop songs 
Yeah, I completely agree. You yeah. Get the, code, you get the chords under your belt, interpret them in whatever way you want. Obviously, you can interpret it, you can play them in a way that's faithful to the original recording, but it's much better for you as a musician and the million other songs you could play in the future if you leave yourself that room and space to develop your own musicality. Yeah. Um, okay, everybody, I wanted to say a huge thank you for joining us today on the, on the live stream. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, Adam and I love doing these live streams. It's lots of fun. We do. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned some new things. If you have enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and also like the video, which helps other people find it in the future. Um, I hope that everybody has a fabulous week. Uh, enjoy listening to the new Beatles song. Enjoy getting your new, your mind completely blown by Joe Pass. Completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we will see you all back here again for another episode of the Music Makers live stream. Adam, thank you for joining me. Thank you, my brother. Thank you to all of you for showing up for yourselves. We are so proud of you. The amount of you that keep showing up every single week and prioritizing your musical progress. It's beautiful. We love to see it. It's awesome. Scan that barcode. Join us in the NGA membership program. Get access to all of our courses. Get access to another live stream. Get access to probably what I, I, you can call me biased, but like the best learning community on the internet. And that's not even exactly. like talking about us. I'm talking about the students that you will yeah, meet. Yeah, nothing to do with us. Yeah, it's the mem yeah the students the are man. the people you can collaborate with. And this is a one last thing too. If you're looking to meet people that you want to collaborate with that are similar skill level to you. We got them, and that's all inside our forum. So we look forward to seeing you there. We look forward to seeing you next Thursday on another live stream. Have yourselves a great week, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks for tuning in.